Across the island of Sodor, one would think that the majority of locations would be easily accessed by the railways. However, this has never quite been the case. Many places on the island still have yet to be reached by the engines themselves. Instead, these towns and villages are often served by roads. Cars, lorries, tractors, buses, and even the likes of Trevor and George can be seen regularly travelling along the quiet country lanes that meander through the hills and fields of the northernmost part of the island. Bertie the bus often liked travelling along these lanes. Before he was sold to the Knapford Road Museum, he would travel along these roads, enjoying the peace and quiet of the countryside compared to the hustle and bustle of city life. But today, he was back on the roads, with an excursion from Arlesborough Bridge Street to Ballaswain via Peel Godred. A broad grin spread across his face as he made his way past farms and lonely cottages. It's lovely to be out and about again, he said to himself. He honked his horn to everyone he met. They all waved back at him, pleased to see him once again. The sun shone and the birds sang. Bertie made good time and was soon on his return journey. He delivered some of his passengers at Peel Godred in time for their connection and set off for Arlesborough. At a lonely farm along the way, he had to stop for some roadworks. He looked over and saw two farm vehicles. One was a light grey tractor he had never seen before. However, he guessed this must be Tammy, the new tractor he had heard about from Terence. The other he recognised as his old friend Trevor the Traction Engine. Trevor and Tammy were working together in a field. Trevor was hauling a threshing machine, while Tammy chugged slowly alongside, catching the corn seeds in her trailer. The look on her face clearly stated she wasn't too keen on going slowly. Can't we go a bit faster, Trevor? She complained. No can do, Tammy, he replied. The grain's got to be pressed just right. Any faster, and we'd lose too many seeds. Besides, you know what happened the last time you rushed your work. Tammy groaned, but decided it was best not to protest any further. Bertie honked his horn at them. Hi, Trevor, he greeted as they drew near to him. Training the young ones, I see. Good to see you too, Bertie, Trevor said. Museum life not good enough for you, is it? The two old friends laughed like anything at this. What brings you up this way? Bertie asked. I and young Tammy here were borrowed to help with the grain harvest while the farmer's tractors are busy with delivering wool to the small railway engines, Trevor explained. What about you? I've just been doing an excursion to Ballas Wayne and back, Bertie stated. It's been marvellous travelling along these old roads again, but... He shuddered violently. Oh, I also had to stop at Gobby Dagan on the way up. One of my passengers wanted to go for a walk there. Best of luck to him. I was glad to get away from there myself. I'd rather not stay there long. Bertie finished a worried look on his face. I understand, Trevor said gravely. Why? asked Tammy. Whatever's the matter with the place? It looks fine to me when I passed it. It's not so much the place itself, said Bertie. It's a bit more something that happened there. I'll tell you about it, but I must be off, he said as he saw the lights ahead of him change to green. I'm sure Trevor will explain it to you, though. Goodbye. And he tore away as fast as he could. Trevor and Tammy said nothing else for the rest of the day as they went about their work. When night came and the two were calling off in the barn, Tammy finally spoke up. Trevor? She asked, why is Bertie afraid of that place? Trevor knew exactly what she was talking about. He gave a heavy sigh. <sighs> Something happened a long time ago there. Gobby Dagan is so for Devil's Mouth. It's not as if it's a particularly terrifying place. 
but there's a lot of superstition surrounding four humps at the bottom of it. What four humps? Tammy asked. The four humps just behind the mountain. They run by a stream, you see. Years ago, a terrible thing happened there involving four teenagers. Who were they? Oh, you may know two of them. One was the Fat Controller, though back then he was called by his first name, Stephen. The other was his sister, Bridget. Oh yes, Tammy exclaimed. Toby told me about them, but who were the other two? One was a young girl called Rebecca Dorothy Brown. The other was a boy. His name was Harry Arnoldson. Stephen and Harry went to the same boarding school in Arlesborough and had known each other for years. Both boys were tall. Stephen had brown hair while Harry was ginger. They got along famously with each other, exchanging jokes and sweets and telling stories about their most keenest of interests, the railway. They talked for hours about the newest additions to either one of the companies, the latest visitors to the North Western Railway, and more often than not, the most recent events and accidents concerning the engines. But Harry Arnoldson and Stephen Hatt couldn't be more different from each other. When Stephen visited his housemaster, the latter responded thus, What? Again, Hatt? My, you'll fill the trophy cabinet with your awards before you leave us. Captain of the cricket team, eh? Brown made an excellent decision to appoint you as his replacement after you won us that last match against Tipmouth Boys School. Take a letter home to your parents this weekend. I insist on their coming to dinner at my house, so that I may congratulate them on raising such a hard-working young lad as yourself, and be sure to attend yourself. It is the least I could do for you, and I wish you every success in your railway career. Indeed, Stephen did well in school. He studied hard and received high marks in all his subjects. Not a year went by when he won at least one prize in school, and his teachers were full of nothing but praise for his efforts. To his credit, Stephen never let this go to his head, and just carried on with his work. He maintained a good relationship with all his peers too, and was a very well-respected figure in his school. The interaction between Harry Arnoldson and his housemaster, however, followed a somewhat different tune. What? Again, Arnoldson? Ah, you'll be the death of us all and the destruction of this fine school before you're through here. Take this, and this, and this, and don't cringe like that, caning's too good for you, my boy. If I were a headmaster, I would have had you expelled. Depicting the French master engaging in carnal relations with the English master when both are happily married men and on a chalkboard for all to see. Write a thousand lines and hand them to me by tomorrow or it's more of the cane for you. Indeed, Harry had something of a reputation amongst his peers for causing several disturbances for want of better words. He was well known for pulling several practical jokes that seemed to increase in severity before suddenly becoming tame again. One week, he would put boot polish on the magnifying glasses in the science laboratories and put whoopee cushions and tacks on the teacher's chairs. Another week, he would make lewd sexual jokes about members of staff and create emergency situations that nearly always turned out to be false alarms. In addition, academia was far from his strongest suit, and he often found himself requesting Stephen's help in his studies. There was, however, one topic that Harry was ahead of Stephen at in many respects. The art of seduction. Harry was incredibly successful among the girls of the nearby towns and villages. When he was not in school, he was spending time with some new girlfriend or other. He would spend the evenings with them, and would often seek to engage them in antics of a sexual nature. This he would often achieve by taking them into the fields where they rolled in the hay, or, in the occasion of her parents being absent from the premises, would escort her to her home and upstairs to her bedroom. 
He would then make his escape from the house by climbing down the nearest drain pipe before anyone woke, and made it back to school in time for the first bell at breakfast. Whatever the situation, neither he nor his girlfriends emerged from it without bedraggled and rugged clothing. This appeared to change, however, when first he laid his eyes on Rebecca Dorothy Brown. Stephen had arranged with Bridget and Rebecca to meet up one afternoon outside the school. The two had known each other since they were in nursery. Both had grown into slim, fine, attractive young girls. Bridget had long brown hair while Rebecca had short blonde hair. They both attended an all-girls school in Knapford. While Rebecca performed well in school, Bridget was relatively unremarkable in her studies, though far from the poorest performer of her class. Yet while Bridget preferred to remain in a position of relative safety, Rebecca was more willing to take risks, such as walking close to the edges of cliffs and often travelling at high speeds on her bicycle. It was perhaps this quality that endeared her to Harry and he to her, Suspecting that such would be the case, and in an attempt to persuade his friend to adopt a more permanent relationship, Stephen arranged the trip so that Harry was invited to come also. The four of them boarded Bertie at the school gates, and he took them up to the mountain they were visiting, Gobby Dagan. They walked for miles and miles and miles, through the grass and over trees and craggy rocks, past fields of cows and horses. Eventually, they set down a picnic hamper between them and laid out the food on the blanket before them. Stephen and Bridget sat on one side, while Harry and Rebecca took their places on the other, huddling together and grinning broadly. Stephen smiled. His plan was working just fine. I say, Harry observed, what are those humps behind you, Stephen? Stephen looked behind him. He saw what Harry was talking about. He had a nasty feeling about them. We read about them, Rebecca explained. They're called the Devil's Humps. They say that the Devil and his wife are buried there. Legend has it, Bridget continued, that if you run around them seven times while holding your breath, they will appear to you. Quite a few people tried that, and well, I don't want to see what happened to them. Stop the nonsense, Harry retorted. Well, I don't know, Stephen said. There's a lot of old myths and legends around these parts. Some of them have been proved to be true, you know. Seriously, Stephen? Harry exclaimed. Look, there's nothing to be scared of. I don't know what's wrong with you. Next thing you'll be telling me is that the Vickersdown Bridge or that old house on the Scarlowy are both haunted or something. I don't believe in that old wives' tale. I'm sure there's nothing wrong with those humps. I'll go and prove it. Stephen and Bridget exchanged uncertain looks, but Rebecca looked on at Harry. A grin spread across her face. She went bright red. She could feel herself becoming more and more attracted to him by the minute. Go on, Harry, she said, a note of seduction in her voice. Rebecca, no, urged Bridget, but it was too late. Harry went towards the humps, took in a deep breath, and ran backwards around them several times. He returned to them shortly. <sighs> See, he said after letting his breath out. Nothing to fear. No one said a word. They just finished their picnic, tidied up, and went on their way. But when they rounded the next bend, they heard a cry in the distance. They looked at each other uncertainly. That sounded like a cry for help. Stephen and Bridget felt apprehensive at this, given what Harry had just done. However, if there was one redeeming feature about Harry, it was that he never turned down a call for help. Immediately, he and Rebecca dropped the hamper they were carrying and ran towards the voice. Stephen and Bridget followed, though at a slower pace, and after. Stephen and Bridget picked up the hamper and followed on, though at a slower pace. When they got there, they saw a woman lying unconscious on the ground underneath some rocks. 
Beside her was a man, obviously in distress. We were going for a walk when she slipped and hit her head on the rocks, he told them. Harry bandaged her head while Rebecca checked for a pulse. She's still breathing, she said, but she's unconscious. Is there a telephone nearby? The man asked. No, I'm afraid not, Bridget replied. We do have a car, though, Rebecca offered. Excellent, the man said. Could you get us to a hospital or anywhere that has a phone? Well, we... Stephen began but was quickly interrupted. Of course we will, Harry said, glaring at him. Stephen and Bridget gulped. On the one hand, there was something very off about this couple, especially how they had appeared right after Harry had run around the humps. On the other, it was clear that, though she was breathing, the woman was still in need of urgent medical assistance. They sighed, and decided it would be best to help them after all. Harry and the man picked up the woman, while Stephen and Rebecca took the picnic basket. Bridget walked on beside them. She had a feeling she would do well to keep her hands free. The man introduced himself as Samuel, and the woman as Lilith. They walked on for some way. Then, things began to go wrong. A few hundred yards away from where they had started the journey back, Stephen felt something slam into the side of his face. He put his hands to it, and was relieved to see that it was just a tomato. Furiously, he looked around and saw a gaggle of schoolboys across the stream, laughing at him. One waved a catapult in the air. Control this pet, control this pet, they did. How's about getting fat early and buying a hat, Hattie? Stephen growled. Ignore them, Bridget consoled. They're no better than trucks. Soon they were approaching the car. Stephen and Rebecca got there first. But no sooner had they unlocked it and put the basket in the boot than they heard a sudden shrill cry. They found Bridget lying face down in the mud. She looked up at them, her face now covered in dirt, pain writhing all over it. Nervously, Stephen and Rebecca looked around. They saw a vine sticking out just under her leg. That wasn't right. Surely it hadn't been there before. Stephen knelt down and gently removed her sock to look at the damage. That's done it, he groaned. You've twisted your ankle. That's all we need, moaned Bridget. Look, it's not too far to Knapford, Harry said. Since we're going to the hospital there, we'll still be able to take you as well. So Stephen and Rebecca gently helped Bridget into the back seat, along with Samuel and Lilith. There's no space in the car, said Stephen, so I'll get on Bertie next time he passes. Good man, smiled Harry. He and Rebecca got in the front and they drove off, leaving Stephen to walk to the bus stop. He looked on after them. He had a nasty feeling this was the last time he'd see them all together. Indeed, they looked very determined that things would turn out all right as they drove off without him. But they had reckoned without Thomas. Thomas was late. His passenger train had been delayed by some point work that day, which made him very cross. Typical, he grumbled. It all had to happen today. First that bad cold. It took five and ages to clean out my smoke box. Then Percy and I had to haul a load of ballast trucks while Donald and Douglas were being mended and now this. He charged along the branch line, desperate to make up for lost time and raced right through Dryor. Annie and Clarabel were worried. Slow down, you'll have an accident. Slow down, you'll have an accident, they cried. Oh, come along, we're running late. Oh, come along, we're running late, Thomas fumed. His wheels pounded the rails and he forged onwards. He could see Bertie tearing past him in the opposite direction. Want a race, Thomas? He called. No chance, Bertie. I'm running late today, he replied. He carried onwards as fast as he could.
Too late, he saw a car approaching the level crossing. He applied his brakes hard and tried to stop. What happened then? No one knows. Perhaps the signalman had forgotten to shut the gates. Perhaps the car had approached the level crossing too fast. Or perhaps the driver had failed to shut off steam and apply Thomas's brakes in time. Anyhow, Thomas shut his eyes as his wheels skidded along the rails. The guard applied Annie and Clarabelle's brakes and they held back as hard as they could, but it was no good. Bridget, Harry and Rebecca looked on in horror and disbelief as Thomas, desperately trying to stop himself, towered above them ominously. They braced themselves for impact. With a resounding crash, Thomas struck the car and pushed it right out of his way. When he stopped, he gently opened his eyes and felt a sharp pain from his buffers. They were dented. But he was more concerned about the car's passengers. His crew jumped down and looked at the damage. The car's front was almost completely destroyed. Slowly, Harry opened his eyes in turn. He looked all about him. Bridget and Samuel were unharmed as was he, and Lilith had not changed. But now Rebecca was unconscious too. Immediately, he got out of the car and explained the problem to the crew. They ran back to the nearest signal box, placing detonators along the line to protect their train. Soon, the wailing sound of an ambulance could be heard. Rebecca and Lilith were loaded aboard the ambulances, and Samuel opted to accompany them to the hospital. Sir Charles Topham Hatt, then the fat controller of the railway, came to collect Bridget and drive her to the hospital himself, since no other ambulances could be spared at the time. He spoke kindly to everyone, reassuring Thomas that the accident was not his fault, and commending Harry on his decision to help Samuel and Lilith. I can only hope that we see more of this sort of behaviour from you, he said. Thank you, sir. Harry replied. With that, he climbed into the Fat Controller's car, and they and Bridget drove off to the hospital to check on the other two and to have her ankle looked at. Thomas looked on in sadness. <sighs> oh dear, he sighed, and I thought my day was bad. There was no time for Harry to return to school. It was already far too late at night. As such, the Fat Controller telephoned the school and explained everything to them. Then he arranged for a hotel to take Harry in for the night. I wish there was more I could do for you, in recognition of your selfless actions today, he said. But there's no more room for you at my house, and it's too late for you to return to your family on the mainland. Sir, you've done more than I could ask for. Thank you, Harry said. The two of them parted as Harry walked to the hotel. He checked himself in and made his way to his room. A few hours later, he heard a knock at the door. He opened it. He gasped. It was Rebecca. I just wanted to say thank you, she said. It was so wonderful of you, what you did for us all back there. But, but I... Harry began. He was puzzled. I don't like where this is How going. exactly did she manage to recover so quickly? Oh, the doctors were practically magicians, Rebecca answered. All it took was a few smelling salts and I was back. They discharged me almost instantly. Stephen and Bridget's father told me about you and I telephoned him. He said you were staying here, so I snuck in, though I never told anyone, and I'd appreciate it if you didn't either. This last bit she said with a disarming smile and a kiss on his cheek. I, I won't, blushed Harry. He felt himself becoming more and more attracted to her by the second. It was clear Rebecca felt the same way. She leaned in further and kissed him full on the lips. Harry couldn't stand it any longer. He took her inside and undressed her as she did so to him. Then 
he laid her down on the bed and began to feel the sweet sensation of her virgin flesh against his own as their bodies became one. Harry sighed in satisfaction as the temperature inside him arose. Or was it inside him? He felt himself sweating more and more profusely. He opened his eyes and discovered that the whole room was on fire. He tried to get up to push Rebecca off of him, but he couldn't. Rebecca pinned him down while some invisible force bound his arms and legs in chains. She laughed, all sensuality gone from her looks. Her body changed right in front of his very eyes. One minute, she was Rebecca. The next, she turned into Lilith. Or was it Lilith? A pair of horns arose from her head. What do you think, darling? She asked. Will he do? Harry looked around wildly. Now he was frightened out of his wits. Desperately, he struggled, trying to break out of his chains. Yes came a familiar voice. Harry looked around. He saw Samuel standing in the doorway, moving closer to him. Samuel! Harry begged. Samuel, please help me! A chain slivered and snaked its way around Harry's neck, crushing it tighter and tighter. The last thing he ever saw was Samuel changing forms from a human body to a body half centaur, half demon, with horns emerging from his head. The last thing he ever heard was Samuel's voice from the satanic creature saying, He'll do. The fire lasted until the morning, claiming five lives. It became instant headline news. But what caused the most concern was the presence of a charred body in a single hotel room. It wasn't the fact that this was the first of the bodies to be found. It was the fact that the neck had been crushed to the point that the coroners were certain that the cause of death had been from strangulation. The fat controller had reported that Rebecca had telephoned him just before the fire was said to have started but was told that Rebecca was still lying unconscious in the hospital. It was two days before she would awake, and a whole week before she found out what had happened. Distressed by everything, and mourning for the death of Harry, she, Stephen and Bridget, told the Fat Controller and the authorities everything, about Harry running around the humps at Gobby Dagan, Stephen being assaulted with a tomato, Bridget twisting her ankle and Stephen heading home on board Bertie and Thomas's accident at the level crossing which had left Rebecca unconscious. Thomas, Annie, Clarabel, Bertie, their drivers, the fireman and the guard confirmed these statements when asked and were equally saddened to learn what had happened. Harry's death came as a great shock to his family. When they had made the arrangements, Thomas had the sad duty of escorting the coffin to the mainland, where it was loaded onto a hearse at Barrow and taken away for the funeral. But there were still more questions than answers about what had happened. Everyone involved mentioned the presence of two other people, Samuel and Lilith. But as the investigations went on and revealed nothing of their presence, Stephen, Bridget and Rebecca began to suspect that something had indeed been very, very wrong. All of these incidents had started after the couple had appeared to them. There was also no record of Lilith having been released from or even admitted to the hospital, or of any sighting of Samuel in the same building. In fact, there had been nothing to prove their presence at all, save for their memories. And when the truth about the meanings and associations behind their names came out, everyone involved in the unusual incident had been left in no uncertain doubt as to who exactly had been the cause of everything. For the names Samuel and Lilith 
have come to be associated with Satan and his wife. And that was it, finished Trevor gravely. Since the two of them were never found, it became possible to everyone that the devil himself and his wife had brought about such a tragedy. But why? Tammy asked. I get that Harry was a rogue and that how he seemed more obsessed with sleeping with girls than how they may feel about it is just plain wrong, but it wasn't like he'd killed anyone or anything. I guess we'll simply never know. All I can say is that Bertie told me the story the next day when he passed by the vicarage orchard. I can only hope nothing like that ever happens again. Trevor opened his mouth to say something else. He stopped when he saw something through the open barn doors. A woman seemed to limp up to the farmhouse door. The farmer opened it, cross about being interrupted from his dinner. Please, begged the woman, there's been an accident. Our cars collided with a bus. There were four of us, me, another woman and two men. One of them is my boyfriend. He and the other woman are now unconscious. Oh, serves me right for going round those humps backwards while holding my breath. Look, please, she said, noticing the farmer's shocked expression. You have to let me use your telephone. Mine was broken in the crash and the others left theirs at home. With a look of sympathy on his face, the farmer let her into the house. Trevor and Tammy said nothing. They looked at each other in a frightened silence, even as the ambulance wailed past them. No one said a word all through the night, or even the very next day, as Tammy set off for home. She begged her driver not to take her anywhere near Gobby Dagan, and was successful in doing so, despite it taking longer for her to get home. But for a long time afterwards, Tammy adamantly refused to go anywhere near there ever again. <laughs>